أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا حبيب إله العالمين محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين We are commemorating the martyrdom of the ninth Imam Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al-Jawad alayhim as-salam Imam al-Jawad was born in 195 years after Hijrah and he passed away due to the poison given to him by his wife according to the reports who was the daughter of Ma'moon Umm al-Fadl in 220 so he lived only for 25 years and his father died year 203 in Khurasan. While he was in Medina, his father was in Khurasan. He passed away 203. Again, he was poisoned by Ma'moon. So two of our Emma were poisoned by Ma'moon and Mu'tasam. Of course, the Umm al-Faz later on, on the behest of Mu'tasam, poisoned Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. Now, if you consider the dates, you would see that when Imam al rida alayhi salam passed away, Imam al-Jawad was only seven or eight years old. And suddenly the Shia found themselves in a very awkward position. And that was what everyone all the scholars of other madahib were mocking them about that your imam is a boy of seven years old and they didn't have any answer for it actually and they were somehow uh, confused themselves not knowing what to do if you remember and if you were here when we were talking about imam al riza alayhi salam i said that during his time the most difficult period for the A'imma was experienced. And that was the Ismailis on one hand were rejecting the Imam of Musa ibn Ja'far, salam, his father. The Waqifis were rejecting the Imam of Imam al-Riza and saying that the Imam stopped at Musa ibn Ja'far And also one other point was there and that is Imam al Raza didn't have any son until he was 48 years old. And during all that time, the critics were criticizing that if you are an Imam, who's the Imam after you? And of course, Imam was continuously telling them that Allah will bless us with someone, with a son, bless me with a son who will be the Imam after me. But no one among the Shia ever thought that their Imam is going to be a boy of seven years old. As I said, they were put in a very awkward position. People, big names, like Safwan ibn Yahya, like, like Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, like Rayyan ibn Salt, they came together and said, what to do? What is the situation? Should we wait until this boy grows and we see whether he is the Imam or not? Or should we now accept him as the Imam? Because, you know, the, the Shi'i faith has always, has always been a very reasonable, rational ideology. Not like, for example, the traditional ideologies that, yes, a boy of several months or 
a couple of years could have succeeded someone else before him as a spiritual leader. It never has been like that. And because of this, the situation at the time of Imam al-Jawad put the Shia in a very difficult situation. A boy of seven years old becoming the Imam. Now, not only the Shia was put in a very difficult situation, Imam al-Jawad himself was put in a very difficult situation. If you go into the history, you will see the number of questions and they were not questions to learn, they were questions to test. Addressed to Imam al-Jawad is more than any other question asked from other Ayyemma Because they wanted to test his knowledge, to try him, to see whether this boy can really be Imam or not. Now, why this situation came up and what happened? From the point of Quran, we have precedence of this. And it's very amazing that Muslims were reading the Quran, and this shows how little attention was always paid, paid to the Quran. It was always the thought, the, the sort of ideas and thoughts which people, I mean Muslims, whether Shia or Sunni, they had made in their minds for themselves, rather than referring to the Quran. They used to refer to those ideas and thoughts. And this is what we have discussed before, that when Imam al-Asr alayhi salam comes, <laughs> we will be in that very difficult position as well, because instead of referring to the Quran and checking our values and our ideas with it, we usually check it against our own values and understanding. And this is going to put us in a difficult position when Imam al Ash comes because he is going to judge according to the Quranic values, not anything else. And if our values are not matched with the Quranic values, then we will somehow, our hearts would reject. It's not voluntary. La ikrah din You cannot force it upon yourself. If your heart reject something because of the values you have created for yourself and you have believed all your life, then when someone comes and says, I am the Imam, I'm the 12th Imam, and he's really, he, he really is, and he gives you certain instructions and he puts forward certain values and your heart rejects them, you reject him. It's not in your hand. So we have, the most important thing is that we have to create those values for ourselves based on the Qur'an. There is precedent for this as well. The Mushrikun, the Quraysh, were always telling to Jews and Christians, because they, they had lots of relations, especially the educated ones in Quraysh, like Nadr ibn Haris, like Walid ibn Uqba, they had very good relations with Jews. In Medina, in other places, with Christians, they were always telling them that you have had prophets and books, and you boast on us that we are idolaters, polytheists, and you, 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 you are pious people, monotheists. If we have a prophet, if someone comes to us to teach us in our own language, in our own culture, then we, you will see how we believe in him, and then, of course, when he came, they rejected him because the values were not equal. Now, as I said, there are precedents of such situations of young people having given big blessings by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one example, which is very interesting, and I say why it's very interesting, is Yahya alayhi salam in the Quran. Now, about Yahya alayhi salam, do you know the story? <coughs> Zakaria, peace be on him, he was the head of one of the tribes of Anu Israel and one of the big rabbis. And of course, he was the prophet. However, other big rabbis, they were not prophets. They were head of other tribes, religiously, from the Lavis. And, uh, but, the, Although they, they had religious authority, but they didn't have 
spirituality. And that's why when Zachariah asks for a son, he says, after me, who's going to be the spiritual leader of my tribe, my cousins? Who are these cousins? They are rabbis. However, they don't know anything about faith. Not anyone who's a rabbi or a cleric or a hujjatul Islam or whatever is deep rooted in faith and spirituality. We, ha we shouldn't just look at the, at the appearance of people. We have to look into the hearts. So he said, what he said, he didn't really want a, want a son. He wants someone that could inherit him, inherit his position rightfully. So that's why he said, I'm afraid of my cousins after myself. So what I want from you, not a son. I want a wali. I want someone who could succeed me, who could help me in this. And Allah said, okay, you want a wali after yourself? Or we give you a son. That wali would be your son. What honor more than this? That wali would be your son. Ya Zakaria, inna nubashiruka bi ghulamin. We are giving you good tidings of a son. Ismuhu Yahya. And we name him. You don't name him. We name him. His name is Yahya. Lam naj'allahu min qablu samia. No one like him before we have created. No one like him before we have created. Sometimes you make a dua, your aspiration has a limit. But Allah doesn't look at the limit of your aspirations. Allah gives according to his generosity, isn't it? Now, of course, Zakaria was asking for a wali to, re to, to inherit his position. However, Allah says, I give you someone like of whom I have not created before. Because this is my generosity. You ask for something up to a limit, I give you without limit. Yurzaguna bagayr hisab, isn't it? Without limit. Now, this Yahya, Lam naj Allahu min qablu samiya. Wa hananan milladunna. This is my mercy and compassion towards you. Because Zachariah, the way he's praying in, at the beginning of Surah Maryam, it, it arouses pity and compassion. That, my God, I'm old. My wife has always been barren. What should I do? What should I do with these cousins around me after myself? Now, this is my compassion. Now, this is... This is not pure that we are giving you. This is not a pure man. This is purity. I don't call it a pure son. I call it purity because this is the root of all purity. Purity follows his example. He doesn't follow purity. Purity follows his example. So, وَحَنَانًا مِنْ لَدُنَّا وَزَكَاتًا now the interesting thing is here, Wakana Taqiyya. He was Taqi. And Imam al Jawad was Taqi, wasn't he as well? Now the, the parallel is here he, uh, on this point. Ya Yahya. Now after Yahya is born, Allah is talking here. There's a jump. This is the Quranic method. It doesn't bore us with details, small details. It jumps the story to the very important and crucial, remarkable. Uh, episodes of this story. Yahya was born, he was grown, now we are talking to him. Ya Yahya, it means we inspired him. He was a child. He was about five years old. We inspired him. Ya Yahya, take the book with the strength. What does it mean, take the book with the strength? It means don't take it uh, as a joke like many of us do. Take it seriously. Do what is mentioned in it 
with strength and with seriousness. خذ الكتاب بقوة. What is the kitab? It's Torah. Take it with strength. خذ الكتاب بقوة. And what else? وآتيناه الحكم سبيا. When he was a child, we gave him hook. Now the exegetes have disputed what's the meaning of hook. Is this prophethood? Is this hikma wisdom? Because Allah gives wisdom to some without giving prophethood to them. Of course, prophethood always include wisdom. Hikma, hook, and hikma. Hikma is wisdom. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ We gave wisdom to him. Wisdom is different from knowledge. Wisdom is when your heart knows what is right and what is wrong. And that's what most of us lack. يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَعَ He gives wisdom to whoever he wishes. وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا To whoever hikmah is given, a great blessing is given to them. Do not compare it with billions and millions and such things. Do not compare it with money at all. It's not comparable. They are two different things. You cannot say that this man is given wealth and this man is given hikmah. No, you cannot compare them at all. مَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا So, when you ask something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cannot ask for prophethood, of course, because the prophethood is ended. And we cannot become prophets anyhow. What we can ask for is hikmah, wisdom. This is the highest thing that Allah would give someone. Now, this hook that Allah mentions, We gave him hook while he was a child. Is this hikmah or is more than hikmah? Apparently, hukm is more than hikmah. It is an authority. We gave him authority in faith. So if he said something to someone about faith, everyone should have followed him. This is hook. As Musa says, when Pharaoh tells him, you left here, you were not a prophet. You didn't have any authority. Pharaoh told him, now you have come back. You say that I have authority from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa says, yes. Of course, that man was killing someone else, oppressing him. I wanted to stop him. He died. Then you wanted to kill me as an innocent person. And he was innocent. He was just defending someone else. The man was killed. And you, without asking me, you wanted to kill me. So I, I escaped from you. فَفَرَرْتُ مِنْكُمْ لَمَّا خِفْتُكُمْ Before, because I was, I was afraid. Because Pharaoh, after Musa came to him, he was talking about the, the blessings that he had given him and all these things. He raised him in his home, in his house. So he says, are you ungrateful now? You have come back to me in this way. He says, I'm not ungrateful. But actually Pharaoh was asking, why did you flee? Why did you escape? He says, of course, because I was afraid. You wanted to kill me. فَفَرَرْتُ مِنْكُمْ لَمَّا خِفْتُكُمْ When I was afraid, I escaped. What happened then? فَوَهَبَ لِي رَبِّي حُكْمًا Allah gave me hukm. وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And made me one of the mursaleen. So this hukm that here is mentioned is authority. Is authority. That he won... Allah gave him authority in faith. What is authority in faith? That everyone should follow. I don't have an authority in faith. I'm just telling you what the people of authority have told, have said. The ayatollahs don't have authority in faith. They are just relaying to you what the people of authority have said. Okay? No one at this moment according to our faith, according to Islam. According to Catholicism, yes, the Pope has authority. Has authority. According to Islamic faith, no one has authority on faith. Except the prophets, except the imams. Now, 
Musa says, فَوَحَبَ لِرَبِّ حُكْمًا Allah gave me hukm, gave me authority. وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِ Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he is leaving Babylon, he says, رَبِّ حَبْلِ حُكْمًا Give me an authority over faith. Ibrahim was someone who was concerned always about others. He wanted to guide <coughs> others as well. رَبِّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي Someone asked, why Ibrahim at the end of his life is asking, he was worshipping God, he was praying right from the, the youthhood, what, from early ages, he was praying up to the end of his life. Then at the end of his life he says, رَبِّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ Make me the one who establishes salat. Why is he saying this? And he's beseeching. He's insisting in this. Why? And then we said, Waman Duriati, not my children, some of my children. Please, please, Rabbana wa taqabbal dua, please accept from me. Make me someone who establishes salat. What is he asking for? He's asking for that authority. That I can be the link between you and people. Salat here is in general meaning the link between man and Allah. Make me the one who establishes this link. And some of my progeny, who are the prophets, who are the Ausiya. So, coming back to Yahya alayhi salam. Ya Yahya, khud al kitaba bi Take the book with the strength. وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ السَّبِيَّةِ We gave him authority in faith when he was a child. Sabi is a child. So, hadn't Muslims ever read this? Yes, they had read it. I mean, when they come against someone like Muhammad ibn Ali, alayhi salam, Imam al Reza has said that he is the Imam after me. He claims that I am the Imam. And everyone is confused. Why? And actually, the Sunni scholars were uh, radical in Shia scholars. Now you have to follow a seven years old boy as your Imam. And you can see this in the books of some of Ahl Sunnah who are criticizing Shias, that look at these Shias, they follow a, a boy of seven years old as their Imam, for example. Yes, of course. We follow Yahya alayhi salam as well. He was a boy of six, seven years old, and Allah gave him hukm. Now, of course, not every boy coming out and saying that I am an Imam, we would accept that. This was someone mentioned by the Prophet, peace be on him, then mentioned by his father, Imam al raza and then tested by everyone. Now, I want to mention one of those trials which was put against Imam alayhi salam. This is, this is coming from non-Shias. You can imagine how Shias meticulously tested Imam al-Jawad. This was the habit of Shia scholars. Whenever Imam passed away, the new Imam, they always put questions to him to test him, to see whether he is up to the standards, up to their standard, or is higher. There is a story about Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam, which... <laughs> probably, inshallah, we'll mention one time when we are talking about the seventh Imam alayhi salam, how he was tested by the Shia after they were confused about the Imam. Now here, after the martyrdom of Imam al Raza alayhi salam, Ma'mun who wanted to contain the Shia, and that's why he had brought Imam al Raza to Khurasan, he summoned Imam al Jawad to Khurasan as well. So he had to come to leave the Medina and come to Khurasan. And he came. And then, when he was only nine years old, he said that, I want to give me your daughter in marriage. Now, certainly, 
a boy of nine years old is not yet up to the age for marriage. However, he wanted to establish this bond, this wedlock, so that follow the conspiracy he was always having in mind that to contain the imams and to somehow have them under control and whenever he wanted to somehow kill them or whatever. So when he wanted to do this, those uh, people from Banu Abbas who didn't know what is his plot, what is his plan, they came to him and they said, why you are doing this? You are giving your daughter Umm al-Fazl to, to a boy of nine years old. First of all, this is not the time for marriage. And secondly, by doing this, what you do, you are making this mulk kingdom to go out of Banu Abbas to Banu Hashim. Or at least you are making them partners. And our fathers have actually tried a lot, they have sacrificed a lot to have this exclusively for themselves. Now, of course, Mahmoud didn't want to reveal what he had in mind. However, he said, no, this boy is much more, uh, has great, bigger intellect than all of you and much more knowledgeable than everyone else. And I will forego my decision I leave my decision, if you could defeat him, because of course he knew his position. And always those who know bring the most damage, not those who don't know. Mahmoud was quite knowledgeable about the position of Imam. He said, ask him questions, if you could defeat him in fiqh, or in theology, or in tafsir, or whatever. I would change my decision. They felt that this is a good deal. That's very easy. Imam al-Jawad has just come from Medina to Khurasan. He's nine years old. What is the, the, the extent of his education in these things? So they went to Yahya ibn Aksam. Yahya ibn Aksam was the high judge. And usually the high judge at the time was the most knowledgeable in fiqh. Not in every aspect, not in theology and other things. The most knowledgeable in fiqh, in rulings. So they told him, could you put a question to Muhammad ibn Ali so that he cannot answer and we give you whatever you want. If you do this for us, these were the heads of Banu Abbas, the cousins, the uncles of Ma'mun. If you do this for us, we give you whatever wealth you want. So, he said, okay, I will do that. Now, he came, this is a famous story, but maybe some of you have not heard it in details. Uh, they brought Yahya ibn Akram to Ma'mun, and they said, Ya Amir al-Mu'min, hadha al-Qadhi in adhinta lahu an yas'al. If you allow him to ask questions from Muhammad ibn Ali, he would do. Because you said, that if he cannot answer you, I will change my decision. فَقَالَ الْمَأْمُونَ يَا يَحْيَا سَلْ أَبَا جَعْفَرْ أَنْ مَسْأَلَةٍ فِي الْفِقْهِ Okay, ask him something in fiqh to see what would be the outcome. Now, Yahya had actually, of course prepared the most difficult question he ever thought in fiqh. I know the most difficult questions always are related either to earth or to hajj. And some very rare incidents or uh, occasions in Hajj which happen, the most difficult questions are there. So he put a question about Hajj. He said, فَقَالَ يَا أَبَا جَعْفَرْ This was the Konya, the nickname of Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. يَا أَبَا جَعْفَرْ مَا تَقُولُ فِي فِي مُحْرِمٍ قَتَلَ سَيِّدًا what is the ruling about a muhrim? Muhrim is someone who puts on a haram, says labbaik. So there are certain things which are haram to him. One of those is hunting. Now he said, what is the ruling about a muhrim who kills, who kills a hunt? 
not only hunt it, but kills it as well. Qatala Sayyidah. Now, this is one of those most difficult things because there are different uh, ranges of the type of animal and uh, the, uh, whether it, it's a bird or it's a, a livestock, uh, 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 sorry, whether it's a bird or a, a walking animal. So, Faqala Abu Ja'far, now look at this here. This made Ma'amun to laugh, actually. قتله في حل أم حرام. Well, you say someone killed a hunt. Did he kill him in haram or outside haram? You know, haram has a is the boundary which is around Mecca, and you cannot enter haram without ihram. You cannot do certain things in haram which you could do in hell. So. Did he kill him in haram or outside haram? Did he kill him knowingly or unknowingly? Did he kill him intentionally or unintentionally? Was he a slave or a free man? Was he a child or an adult? Was it the first time he was killing or the second time? Was the hunt a bird or other than a bird? The bird was it small or big? Was he insisting in doing, doing this or later on he repented? Did he do it in night or on the, in, during the day? Was he muhrim for hajj or for umrah? Now, Yahya ibn Aksam even didn't know <laughs> about these things. That what would be the difference between these, these issues? So, uh, he, he just mumbled, he didn't know what to say, in a way that everyone in the majlis realized that he is panicked now. And everyone was amazed of the extent of knowledge of this boy. Now, as again, when we say a boy, you bring into your mind, invoke Yahya ibn Zakaria, okay? Not an ordinary boy. Then, without, of course, Yahya ibn Aksam, he even couldn't tell him what were, was the situation, which one of these he meant, because he didn't know the answer, of course. So, after this, فَقَالَ الْمَأْمُونَ This is funny. فَقَالَ الْمَأْمُونَ اَخْتَبِعَ عَبَا جَعْفَرَ Okay, start the marriage, because now these people are defeated, and everyone is here, all these ulama are here, now you start the khutbah for marriage. And then, of course, after... Uh, Yahya ibn Aksam and everyone leaves, Ma'amun asks Imam alayhi salam, okay, could you give us the answers? And he gives all the answers, of course, it's very long. He gives all the answers that what are the, uh, the, the atonement or kafara for any type of these, and they are all different, they are all different. And then, of course, he puts questions to the ulama of fiqh that they could not answer. So, this is uh, something which, as I said, this is what the, the ulama from among the non-Shia, the questions they put to Imam alayhi salam. The Shia put very severe and testing questions to Imam, and it's after all these that they, the huge personalities, personalities who had spent all their life in theology, in fiqh, in tafsir, they all humbled before the Imam Now when we talk about him, of course for all of us, it's, it's very natural. As a matter of course, we know that the, the ninth Imam is Imam al-Jawad But you put yourself in that situation. And the Shia wanted really to, to defer to someone of that age. So they had the right to realize whether this is the true Imam or not the true Imam. And that's how it happened. And Alhamdulillah, uh, he had a, a great uncle, Imam al-Jawad had a great uncle called Ali ibn Ja'far, one of the uh, very remarkable 
personalities in hadith and fiqh, Ali ibn Ja'far, we have lots of hadith reported from Musa ibn Ja'far through him. He was the brother of Imam al-Kadim he was the uncle of Imam al-Riza and he was the great <coughs> uncle of Imam al jawad Now everyone thought that since Imam al Reza alayhi salam didn't have a grown-up heir, the Shia should defer to Ali ibn Jafar because he was the most prominent person. But when great ulama came to, to the presence of Imam al Jawad, while Ali ibn Jafar was present, of course, this Ali ibn Jafar is not the one whose tomb is in Qum. We don't know where his tomb is, Ali ibn Jafar. He is a different Ali ibn Jafar. Otherwise, he would have been as big as Ma'asuma Salamullah alayha, as big. Now, they saw that this old man, and Imam al-Jawad was seven, eight years old. He, he hadn't left for, Madi, for Khurasan yet. This man just sits in front of him like a humble slave. And when he wanted to go, he put his shoes in front of his feet out of humbleness and his brothers and his cousins blamed him but what is this you are an old man you are the head of the Banu Hashem at this time you are the head of the Alawites at this time and you humble yourself before this boy like that he said this is very very interesting and this is how we have to think in our heart and in our mind he said Look, look at my beard, it's all white. Look at my face, I'm very old. I have spent all my life in worship, everyone knows that. I've spent all my life learning in knowledge of hadith and other things. However, Allah has found something in this boy that he hasn't found in me. He has blessed him with something that he hasn't blessed me. Should I be like shaitan to deny? Of course not. I have to hum humble myself because Allah, Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalata. Allah knows best where to put his message. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alayhi tahirin. Allah